Hello, everyone. Welcome to today's webcast, ServiceNow Roadmap to Customer Service. I'm John Bartz with Network Consulting Services, and I have Stephen Taylor, our Service Delivery Manager, here with us today. Hi, Stephen. Hello. Audio check there. Sound great. We're going to deep dive on the ServiceNow Customer Service Console today. Uh, real quickly, some housekeeping notes. Go ahead and ask questions throughout the Q&A today, and we'll tackle those as we go through it. And we hope to keep it to about 30 to 45 minutes today. If there's any part you'd like to dive in deeper with us, uh, please feel free to reach out to us uh, after the webcast. Okay, that's it. Let's go ahead and uh, dive right in. Stephen, go ahead and take it away. Great. Thank you. So today we're going to talk about the customer service module inside the ServiceNow platform. Um, this module was released uh, two versions ago on the uh, Geneva instance initially, and from there they, you know, continue to life cycle and develop different components of it. Uh, before we dive into the product itself, I did want to just cover a couple of things that ServiceNow provides. Um, this is material that, that they've created um, to kind of talk about this as an initiative. Um, you know, their mantra on everything right now is, is service at the speed of light um, or work at light speed. Um, so the mantra around customer service is resolve customers, resolve customer issues at the speed of light. Um, a little more on that is kind of where they're expecting this market to go. Um, you know, there's a lot of opportunity here where ServiceNow recognizes that their platform is, is unique enough um, to really differentiate itself in this space while uh, leveraging components that they're very strong and very competent in. Um, customer service as a whole is built on top of the IT modules, um, the traditional ITSM suite, um, and ties directly into your incident problem change um, ITSM world that most of the original customers and many of the new customers are still focused on. Um, a couple of competitors in this market are SAP, Oracle, um, Salesforce, obviously, Microsoft Dynamics, Zendesk, and uh, uh, Pega. Um, ServiceNow sees areas where they know they're not directly competing with these, um, but do see themselves as, as long-term being able to compete with the products that they have there. Um, so without going through this entire slide deck, I really want to stay focused on the tool during this presentation um, and talk through uh, a couple of components, but before I do that, one last slide I really wanted to emphasize was this concept of, of customer service to begin with. Um, <clears throat> traditionally, CRMs are disjointed from the rest of the IT organization, um, which creates a gap in allowing you to really, truly understand service interruptions and how they're impacting your customers. Uh, why I like this slide so much is, you know, most companies believe that they are delivering superior customer service um, while 8% of the people really actually believe that they are. Um, and that gap is created primarily because there's a lot of effort that goes into doing customer service, but primarily uh, customers are less feeling that they don't have real insight into what's going on with their, their circumstances or situations um, while interacting with different customers, or I mean different businesses. So. This was pretty illuminating to me. This is definitely how I feel my experiences with most customer service departments go. Um, you know, they, they tout being the best in customer service, and yet when I have interactions with them, I feel frustrated or lost. Um, these are areas that ServiceNow is trying to address and trying to address in the way that they've developed their own community and their own support models. Um, and essentially extending what they've done through things like their high portal um, out to the rest of the customers so that they can leverage those same capabilities. Um, so that said, you know, diving right into the tool, um, this is the view from an administrator. Uh, so obviously I have full admin rights. I can see everything in the system, which can be somewhat overwhelming. Um, so where we're going to stay focused is inside this customer service module. And at a high level, I just want to go through kind of the different capabilities and components that make up this solution, um, and then we'll dive into some more specific use cases and seeing it from a couple of different views. Um, so off the bat, you know, you can manage knowledge, you can look at your personal schedules, you can look at different skills, 
Um, there's a section to review cases. So cases are similar to incidents, but incidents are traditionally an IT-focused record type um, that specifically stay pointed towards service outages. Cases can be a little different than that because cases are customer focused, they're less defined up front and they need to be a little more flexible as far as servicing an end user when it could be something as simple as a question, it could be uh, you know, a status check, it could be that something is broken, um, but separating out those customer records from internal incident records is key in order for those segregations of duties and, and proper focus and proper attention being given to the right issues at the right time. Um, so looking at customer service records, um, from this view, you know, you can look at all records, you can look at things specifically assigned to you, you can create new records, um, very typical to the same look and feel that you have in the ITIL world if you were working incidents or supporting an internal organization as opposed to customers. Um, one of the things that really ties this together are the different customer account types. So the customer partners and the customer accounts live in the same table. They're basically the same records with some different data points that delineate the two of them and then open up different functionality. Um, as an account owner, I can see anything listed under my account. As an account parent, and this leverages the parent-child relationship that you see, again, throughout the entire system. Um, you notice the example here that even in this case list, we have some Boxio and then we have Boxio USA. If we go over to accounts, you can see that Boxio sits there at a high level and then there's sub companies that live, or sub accounts rather, that live underneath that. Um, so inside of this Boxio record, we can see that it's listed as a customer. Um, these are special handling notes too. We'll get into these a little bit as well. Um, but as a customer, I can see under account hierarchy that I also have other companies that live underneath this Boxio umbrella. And then again, even under the Boxio EMA account, there are sub counts for France and Germany specifically. And this allows that relationship to roll up to Boxio so that when I put the primary contact as Julie, we don't have a parent account at this level, but this allows Julie to see everything that's going on inside of these sub-accounts. So if we go into the Boxio USA account, you can see that it has listed the parent account for Boxio. And it's as simple as that to tie different companies together. You don't have to necessarily go build out complex account relationships um, or define things at more granular levels. They do allow for that more granular relationship definition to exist. You can come in here and create things like partner accounts, which would be different than a customer account. And a partner account, again, has that same ability as a parent account to see all accounts that it has within its partner portfolio, and that would be defined through these account relationships. Inside of an account record, you can also create contacts. So every contact can be an actual logged in user. It can also just be a record for contact information. So if they're not gonna leverage things like the portal, you wouldn't necessarily need to go create them a login and go through the onus of, of granting them roles so they have different view rights and things. You can simply create a contact record for that user and have that contact record facilitate communications to them without them needing to log into things like a portal. Um, it has geographical information that you can leverage. So if you need to add different addresses or if it has multiple corporate offices or um, whatever the case may be, you can have one or many addresses associated with an account and then leverage those addresses for things like doing field service dispatches. It has a relationship for cases. So this will show open cases that were created for this account specifically. So in this case, since we're looking at Boxio USA, we're only seeing the cases that apply to Boxio USA. You have an area for assets, and actually to display this a little better, I'm gonna go back to the Boxio account, not the Boxio USA account. So again, you can see those assets, or those cases that were delivered. You can associate assets directly with an account. And within these assets, uh, this allows you to create different entitlements, different service contracts, um, and different data points in order to properly support this. So within the asset, you can nest other assets, you can have asset contracts, and again, you can track the cases um, that are being opened and delivered against that 
particular asset. Inside of your contracts, you can actually define high-level or very granular contracts. So in this scenario, you know, they, they have fairly light information around what the contract really is. You could actually attach a signed contract if you needed to and then manage that through the attachment manager. Um, adding that can be as simple as dragging it from a finder window over into the form itself and just dropping it. The attachment handler works the same throughout the entire system, just like in the ITIL world. Um, where you can drag and drop those in and then manage them through the attachment manager tool um, as well as use this tool to browse for files should you want to go that route. Um, it allows you to tie specific assets that are covered under this contract. It allows you to create additional terms and conditions. It allows you to create a, a subset of contacts. Um, this also would add these contacts to the account level as well. And then again, you can track cases against this contract specifically. You can also see entitlements. So the difference between contracts and entitlements are contracts are your terms and conditions and entitlements are the services that you're going to receive based on those contract terms and conditions. So you can tie contracts and entitlements together. They can also be treated separately. So if you have standard entitlements that you give to all customers, you don't have to go configure those into the contracts. However, if you have one-off entitlements that need to be created specifically because of terms and contracts, you can create new entitlements, create new support works, and then tie those into things like your service level agreements so that you can track performance against those entitlements. This is also where you can show nested accounts. So again, looking at Boxio, we're seeing the three child accounts that are associated with it. And then if we went into the EMA account, we would again see child accounts associated to the EMA account. And again, we can see that in the account hierarchy as well. So there's ways to nest various records and record types to meet the different use cases that you might run into while trying to support customer organizations. Um, there are account relationship types. So this allows you to define relationships between various accounts, um, either out of box, which again can be something like a partner account, where I could come in and say, NCSI is a partner of Boxio. We, we support all of their organizations and therefore we need to have access to all of the issues that they interface with my organization in. Um, you can also add account team members. So this is similar to contacts, but it doesn't necessarily leverage some of the communication capabilities. Um, there's contract relationships. Uh, so these contact relationships can define relationships between various contacts. So you can use that for things like escalations, where you may want to contact the person that opened the ticket initially, but once something has a certain priority or reaches a certain SLA threshold, you may want to use these contact relationships to look up additional contacts to escalate those notifications with. Um, and then there's also social profiles. Um, these are, again, just more data around social media interactions so that if you do decide to leverage some of the social capabilities, um, you can hook in using those profiles uh, to, to point and cater those communications. So there are also contacts, as I mentioned. Um, contacts can be specific end users that are just contact information. They can also uh, be given accounts. Um, so people can actually request accounts using different codes. When you set up an account, um, you, can, you can create some registration features that allow you to let people self-register. And so in the case of Boxio, Boxio USA, if I was an end user and I did not have an account and wished to request one, there is a re register feature on the portal's uh, homepage when you're not logged in that would allow me to put in my information and send a request in for an account to be provisioned for me. And I can use this code here to tie that request specifically to Boxio USA. Now there's additional workflows and capabilities that you can leverage that will allow some of this to be even further automated where if the code matches um, that it will auto create the account for you. Um, there's additional ways that you can send out these registration codes as well. Um, you don't have to use a text-based registration code. There are some capabilities that will allow you to use things like QR codes. 
so they can scan the QR code with their phone, be taken right into the registration screen, and submit their request. Um, those requests all queue to a single spot where you can come in and see those requests being made. Um, this is where a customer service manager uh, could come in and potentially, you know, assign out the work to have these accounts reviewed and created, or you can send that off to the account owner as well. Um, partners and uh, customer service managers can approve and create accounts for users within their own account. Um, again, we covered contract service and service contracts and entitlements. Um, so there's also products and assets. So product models are sort of a parent record of sorts that allow you to put in standard information around an asset um, with some different rules around what that asset is, what, what you want it to do when somebody registers with that asset. Um, and from there you can, uh, you know, build out different SLAs or different support models from that product model as well. I apologize, this is loading a little slow. I am in a public demo instance. Um, everything that I'm also showing right now while we're waiting for that to load um, is leveraging the out-of-box plugins. I have not customized this uh, tool yet to, to meet all of the capabilities. Um, we'll probably do another webinar around enabling all of those additional capabilities at another time. Uh, but do know that there are significant um, enhancements that you can enable uh, that, that allow you to more seamlessly interact with some of your customers. Um, there's also a lot of documentation out on the doc site on how to configure a lot of this, as well as training specifically for this module that ServiceNow provides. So if you do want additional deep dives, um, outside of this webinar, outside of the series that we do, please know that there's just a lot of material out there for you. Um, so now that we've got the asset loaded, you can see in here that we place a manufacturer, we give it a CI class, um, you know, we obviously name it, and then we have specific configuration items that we can link to. And we can leverage these for business service mapping so that if we're providing a service, um, you know, let's say we're a software as a service company and we have an outage, by having these items hooked into our CMDB as configuration items, we can also use the dependency maps in order to raise incidents against those and then really look at the entire uh, set of affected customers based on them sharing that same asset. Um, we can also see additional assets of the same type. So this is, again, the parent record for the model. And here we can see the individual assets themselves. So their asset tag numbers, their configuration items, if they're actually plugged into, uh, you know, production environments, we can see cost data, we can see company data or assigned to data. Um, there are different compatibles as well. So the compatibles uh, will allow you to show, uh, you know, different items that could potentially nest in with a model. Um, and then the generic information for it as well, such as the model category, which is going to be displayed um, when you're picking asset types, uh, the short description, whether or not you're tracking the asset, acquisition models, cost models. Uh, a lot of this stuff can also tie into your IT financial management suite as well, um, so that you can do life cycling and planning around some of these uh, services if you're providing services for end users around their assets as opposed to just selling assets. Um, so once you have your product models defined, then you can actually build your assets out themselves. Uh, out of box, it does show a fair number of assets that may not be tied directly to customers, but when you're viewing assets inside the case itself, it often will uh, only show you assets that are tied to that account specifically, which makes navigating that much easier. This, this screen can be a little overwhelming when you see the nearly 3,000 assets, but when you're actually creating a case, the logic on the case record will filter these down to the assets that are specific to that account. There are also orders. So orders are a newer uh, enhancement with uh, Jakarta. I believe this will continue to get built out as well, but the initial focus of the customer service module was really business to business. Um, this is them extending the, the service line out to being a business to consumer product as well. 
and allowing you to actually create catalogs on your customer portal that you can order um, products from. So if you were a company that sells widgets, you can now go sell your widgets to your customers in the customer support portal and track those orders and also raise cases against those orders to resolve any issues. Um, and then down to the administration will stay fairly light, but again, you can define relationship types so that you can select those instead of build them out as you need to go. A generic properties window that allows you to define some of the customizations, um, such as case email, so that it doesn't leverage the same email address that your help desk might be leveraging with the base system configuration. Um, so that's, you know, the record types and kind of a high level view of accounts and some of the components that make up the support model. Um, so I just want to pause really quick and see if there's any questions um, before we move into what it looks like to actually create a case and what the portal looks like from a customer's view. Um, so are there any questions? I don't see any in there right now, but feel free to um, type in your questions in either the Q&A or the chat function. We'll, we'll be watching that. So we're good to go. Great. Thanks, John. Okay, so what I want to demo now is what it really looks like to use the tool. So um, we're going to go ahead and impersonate Julie Lewis, who was the account owner for the uh, Boxio Corporation. So if we come into the customer service portal, right off the bat, Julie's presented with a really in-your-face search bar. Um, you know, there's a lot of different resources that she can see, a lot of different menus that are available to her, chat features, profile features, but what they really put right at the forefront of it is this search bar. Um, very similar to the kind of Google philosophy in life of uh, the fastest way to find something is to just ask for it. Um, So by searching, what we're given is a couple of different breakouts. So we're looking at knowledge bases, we're looking at cases, and we're looking at questions. Um, this is searching multiple tables simultaneously. My, my search criteria may not have been the best. Um, but you can see that right off the bat, we're given you know, a fair number of ways to try to deflect this incident from becoming uh, a real case to begin with. And right here, I can go ahead and click on this because maybe that's close to what I want. And I can see right off the bat, you know, common router and IP settings. I can see this knowledge base article, um, and I can view through it and, and really see if this solves my problem um, in order to try to prevent a case from actually being opened. Um, again, because Julie is an account manager for that parent account and has uh, the right to see all of the cases and assets across all of the companies, we can look at the cases field here we can see all of the different cases open across the Boxio enterprise, um, not just the ones that are open for Boxio proper, but like we can look at this one, which is assigned to John Jason and uh, is actually for the Boxio USA account. Um, these forms are also customizable, so right off the bat, you know, out of box, you get a, a handful of fields for a case view. Um, but should you decide that you wanted to add a field to show what company the case was for, or you wanted to add a field for, um, you know, how your SLAs are doing or a related list on the bottom, whatever level of detail that you want to expose to your end users, you can do that through customizing the form as an admin in the exact same way that you would customize any form for, um, you know, the service management side as well. Um, so if you've been an administrator on the tool in the past, this should all be very familiar. Um, you can also come in and do some of your quick filtering. So if I wanted to see, you know, just priority one issues, I could go ahead, um, do a show matching on that. And uh, all right, it's a demo, so not everything can go perfectly. In theory, though, um, I think I think this is more my internet connection in this demo instance being a little slow than it is trying not to chug on the back end, but you can still use the filter criteria that you use in all of the other list views. You can still come through and sort by priority. You can still sort by state um, and really navigate this pretty quickly. You can also just throw in little quick search criteria. So I could do 1006, and it's going to quickly filter down because I'm using that contained statement. 
um, right to the record that I'm looking for. Or same thing here, if I really wanted to say, I know this thing starts with KX, I can search KX and it's gonna look for this to start with KX and show me all the resulting cases that are already opened against that. Um, the other thing that I can see as Julie um, is the different assets that are associated with Boxio. So you can see here Boxio proper has these uh, five assets that are associated with their account and then Boxio EMA has this IRS 5875 Linux server and because Julie is again that account administrator at, at, at the parent level, she can see all of the assets associated from there. She can also drill into this asset and see some components around what this asset is, what the cost was, what account it belongs to, the, the model, the model category, uh, what the serial number is. And then again, she can actually come in and create additional asset contacts. So as the account owner, if she decides that really, uh, you know, Steven Taylor needs to be the one that is responsible for this asset, she can come in and add that contact and any support person that has an issue proactively or reactively can now go and contact and communicate with me as opposed to um, leaving this up to Julie, who may or may not have the expertise or motivation to, to work with it. Again, because she is an account manager, she has the ability to manage users herself. Um, so she can come in and create new users and we'll actually run through that really quickly because it's a fairly straightforward process. Um, so you can come in, you know, throw in a first name, a last name, select some different data points. Um, and I can throw in a contact number. And then I can submit this record. And immediately I'm presented with the option to give a user ID field. So I can, again, I can create this for contact purposes without really having to provision somebody an account. But if I did want Demo Steve to come in and go ahead and, and log into the portal to be able to take more actions, then I can just go ahead and provision him an account um, by just creating the user ID. And what that's gonna do is contact, it's gonna send an email out and that email is going to contain login credentials for me to set up a password. The other thing that I can do here is actually come in and assign roles. So I can say that they're a customer or I can say that they're going to be a customer admin because maybe I'm getting tired of creating accounts for people. Um, so I can grant those roles and give those permissions out. And then if I need to say demo Steve leaves, then I can go ahead and also just disable the login. So it gives me full control to keep my accounts cleaned up and to keep the contact information relevant to what's really going on in my organization instead of relying on ServiceNow admins or your customer support agents to maintain that for them. Um, another thing I can do is come in and see approvals that are, are routed to me. So in this case, um, you know, these are those two accounts that we saw sitting in the queue uh, when we were looking at the requested accounts. So, since Christina Staples uh, has decided to leverage that register uh, or that registration code, that registration code recognized that I owned this account. So it went ahead and sent an approval to me so that I can approve the a creation of her account um, or reject it and say, no, she doesn't, she doesn't need one. Um, and I can quickly just go ahead and approve that and I can see that approval here. Um, this can also leverage uh, different manager approvals for things like if you do go ahead and create a store where products can be ordered from, those approvals can route to me as the account owner and I can put controls in play that allow me to prevent somebody from purchasing something from this, you know, portal without a, a proper authority or, or checks and balances to make sure that purchases are done correctly. Um, the other thing too is there's a publications uh, component where they can cater different uh, messaging strictly or straight to me based on a, a pile of criteria. So they can decide that they want to post a publication for all people that are part of the Boxio enterprise. Um, you can also publish things for specific products. So in this case, um, they have the product alert for that KX5000. This product alert 
is built for every single user that has the KX5000. So any account that has the asset registered for this will receive this publication and can see that there's a recall going on for this um, due to defective fan trays. Uh, this can give me a direct link to schedule a technician to repair the work. Um, so by clicking on this, I'm taken into a service catalog for scheduling the visit. Um, this leverages the field service dispatching component, and this actually did not redirect properly. Um, this is a bug. This should have popped out so you didn't have the two bars, but um, a quick modification to the portal itself would fix that or just opening a high ticket with ServiceNow. I'm sure they're aware of it. Um, but you notice that this pre-populated a lot of information for me. So it knew I was Julia. It knew I was at Boxio. Because of the way that link was built, it also knew that I had the KX5000 series. And so because these are associated with my account, by popping in through that template, all of the data is populated. And I don't have to do anything more than um, click Submit on this. I can go ahead and schedule an appointment date. It did default some time in there for me, but I can leverage the calendar and I can say, you know what, let's do that on November 3rd and um, go from there. So now let's switch that to November 3rd. I can go ahead and submit this. And it's now created a new case for me that I can go ahead and browse over to. So inside this case, you know, I can send more information. Immediately see my comments being appended. I can see stats around the tickets as to what uh, you know, the priority is, when it was created, what the state is, what the number is. I can also see the account information that was filled out, um, as well as the description. Um, I can also come in and add attachments if I need to give supporting documentation. I can also do that through here. And then um, I can tell it my location um, and allow it to actually add the geolocation of, of where I'm at in order to route a dispatch tech. Um, and you can see that it pulled in my address beautifully. Um, coming back into here, I can now see that in my cases list here as well. Um, if I sort by number, then I can see my recall alert ticket that I just generated. Um, and again, I can go back into here, view information around the case itself, um, post additional comments, or I can close this case and say, you know what, we, we got it handled. Um, I don't need this open anymore, we're good. So you'll notice when I close it too, I'm immediately taken into a survey screen. Um, these surveys are customizable and leverage the new survey tool as well. Um, but these surveys allow you to keep a pulse on how people are feeling your service is going. Um, back to that slide uh, where 80% of companies think they're doing a great job and 8% of their customers feel they're doing a great job. This gives you the capability of deciding to send these surveys out at random or to do it at the end of every case in order to track what those satisfaction scores look like and really keep a pulse on how your users are feeling so that you can adjust. Um, everything in this world is like everything else in service now where it should be iterative improvements to the process. Um, you should never ever let a process die uh, or, or become stale or stagnant. Um, and ServiceNow's roadmap themselves will continue to add features and enhancements um, that allow you to really uh, thrive with, with uh, new improvements and new ideas. Um, the last component I want to demo is really just uh, what, what they call OmniConnect. So you have the ability to do CTI integrations, uh, integrate with screen pops, have phone data, uh, plug into the customer data and auto-populate fields. Um, those are a lot of the enhancements that we'll talk to in the next series around this tool. Um, but the OmniConnect concept that, that ServiceNow is really proud of is that you can communicate um, in, in all ways that, that people would like to communicate at this point. So there's mobile components through the tool. Um, all of ServiceNow's portals are mobile responsive. So just based on screen size, you know, everything will continue to render beautifully. Um, mobile experience is excellent. You can do chat, you can do text message, you can do phone call. Um, they've really opened all of the channels of communication open um, and, and really try to push 
whatever user is comfortable with whatever method, um, they, they push hard to give them an, an avenue to, to get support and to stay connected um, without necessarily having to go one specific path. Um, so with the chat component, I can go ahead and throw out a, a customer support queue. Um, and this is actually a, a queue feature, uh, independent record. It's not, um, it's not specific to uh, Julie or, or one case. It, it's across her account. It has the data points that allow you to search against it. You can report on it. Um, and it queues up an agent. And then on the flip side, if I go into a new, one of the support reps, I can see those queued up by coming into the chat window and going into the support section of the chat window. And now I can go ahead and accept that chat as John Jason. And when I accept that chat, it creates exactly what you would expect, just a little IM conversation between the two of you. Um, again, since this is creating a record on the back end, it leverages that ability of customer comments versus work notes. So as John Jason, I can say, and say, hey, Julie, let me look into your issue. And then I can add a work note on that doesn't go to Julie that says, and this comment doesn't go back to Julie. This comment stays in the record as a comment that I can use as a technical work note, but it's not sending it off to her. So I can take notes as an agent uh, that are outside of what Julie needs to see or what Julie might care about and then when I'm ready to talk with her again, I can flip it back over and say, okay, I'm ready to help. From here, I can also go ahead and transfer this to another chat agent. I can create a case from it, or I can even create an incident if I know this is an internal thing that maybe I want to pass off to IT. Um, for the sake of this demo, we'll go ahead and create a case. And you can see that the channel that it came in through was chat. Uh, it pulled in the account, it pulled in that it was Julie, it pulled in her entitlements, it pulled in her contracts, and now I can go ahead and finish this conversation um, simply through this ticket. So, you know, I can tell her, hey, you know, we, we went ahead and created a ticket for you. And once this record saved, and it actually commits to the database where I get the ticket number. Now there was a little delay there. I just got the, my broken message, but. <laughs> but you can actually drag the case number itself. Um, oops. Apparently not. Okay, so my Mac's not behaving well. You could actually grab this case number and drag it right into the chat to create a link for that. Um, a lot of these, when they uh, copy over, they'll copy the full URL of the case itself. So even if I do a copy like that, it condenses it down and shows that I can now just go click into the case. So if I flip back over to Julie, um, and come back into my chat conversation. And I see that Jason's left it, but uh, some of the notes are still a little behind. Again, these demo instances, um, I apologize, they are a little under horsepowered for some of these. Um, but essentially what would happen is, is I could come in and click on the link that was provided by John Jason and be taken right back into that view of the record itself. I can also come back into the cases at this point and see my router is broken. Um, click into this and now I can see, you know, all of the conversation that we had during that chat. 
Um, it kept it all in the logs, the things that were spoken just in the chat itself, and then, you know, any additional comments that John Jason would make going forward would also show up in the record. Um, so at a high level, um, you know, that is the customer service management module. Um, I hope that it was uh, helpful for everyone on the call. Um, this is, again, a fairly high-level dive in the, uh, in the sense that there are a lot of capabilities that go beyond this. Um, that we'll cover in additional segments. Um, but does anybody have any, any questions before we wrap up? Thanks, Stephen. I don't see any questions uh, in right now. If you do have any questions, feel free to reach out to us uh, after the webcast as well. But thanks for joining us today, Stephen, and audience, thanks for joining us. Uh, this demo is part of our Coffee Break webinar series, so coffee cards will be sent out to you later today. Uh, and yes, if you're watching the recording later, if you reach out to us on our website and ping us, we will we'll send you one out as well, too. Um, if you have any further questions, go check out our website, ncsi.us. You can find our contact info there. And Stephen, let's go ahead and wrap it up. Any, any final uh, comments or? No, I, uh, I appreciate you putting this together. It'll be the, this is the, the again, the first of, of many of these to come. So. Please, everyone, check back later. Um, we'll only get better at doing them as well. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining today. Absolutely. And we'll uh, send you out an email when we do the next one. Most likely about every month or so, we'll do a ServiceNow uh, or Service Management uh, webinar. So thanks for joining us today, everyone. And we'll see you next time. Thank you. Have a great day.